All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second panel of this afternoon on the broad topic of information operations. Uh, my name is Kuba Machak. I'm a legal advisor at the International Committee of the Red Cross and also the general editor of the Cyber Law Toolkit. Uh, as some of you have uh, attended yesterday's session about the toolkit, know quite well. So uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross is a humanitarian organization with a specific mandate to protect the lives and the dignity of victims of armed conflict and to provide uh, these individuals with assistance. And so from our perspective, this includes also protection from new forms of threats. And so these are threats such as those that are posed by online misinformation, disinformation and hate speech. And so this is a growing concern today and uh, that's why it's something that we are looking into. And so the ICRC has recently issued a detailed report on uh, these uh, topics uh, that summarize our initial findings. And so just uh, one thing to share before we get into the substance of the panel is that one of the key findings for us is that the rapid evolution of digital information technologies is turning misinformation, disinformation and hate speech into an exacerbating and accelerating driver of conflict dynamics. And so this happens both online and offline. So this is why we will be very carefully uh, following today's presentations and debates. It is a topic that uh, uh, I find professionally and personally very important. And it's great to see that we have such a strong audience here as well. So we have a wonderful panel with three distinguished speakers. And the way that we're going to do this is fairly informal. So we have agreed that I'm going to present each of our panelists uh, just before they give their talk. And so we will have three presentations of up to 20 minutes each. And then we will have a joint Q&A at the end. So I would just ask you to already start thinking about your questions, of course, and there will be space for that right at the end of the panel. So, and we have also agreed that our panelists uh, will have a mi mixture of styles, so some of them will be sitting down, some of them will come to the lectern, so we will run this fairly informally and we look forward to that. So without further ado, let me introduce the first of our panelists. So we have Dr. Talita Diaz, who is the Senior Research Fellow on the Chatham House's International Law Program and also a research fellow at the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict, known as ILAC. So Talita has published her research widely in uh, some of the top international journals in the field, and she's the author of an award-winning book with the title Beyond Imperfect Justice. So today Talita is presenting a paper on limits on information operations under international law. Over to you, Talita. Thanks so much, Kubo, for the kind introduction. And I have to start my presentation with the usual disclaimer that the views that I am expressing today are my own and they do not represent the views of Chatham House. Um, and everything that I say is in my personal capacity. So uh, with that, um, I will speak today about the limits on information operations under international law. So a very heavy topic, there's a lot to cover, but I'm gonna try and keep my presentation very short and, um, and very focused. And really what I want to do today is to focus on three main points, um, which of course draw on my paper that you can find in the proceedings of the conference. Um, and the first, the first point really is the rationale behind this paper. So I want to talk to you a little bit about why I, I decided to write this paper. Um, and the second point is uh, a preliminary point about the application of international law in cyberspace, which has led to a lot of confusion, a lot of debate in the field. So I think it is important for us to address that before going into the substance, which will be my third point. And that is delving deep into how international law actually applies to and limits information operations. So um, basically, uh, the rationale. So why, why this? Why bother writing about international law uh, and information operations, right? So there's a lot of buzz and a lot of talk about the impact of misinformation, disinformation, um, hate speech, as Kubo said. Uh, from a policy perspective, from a cybersecurity perspective, uh, but what role does international law have in all of this, right? And a lot of people are skeptical of 
the role of international law in, in limiting these operations, right? So the orthodox view is that international law has nothing to say about that, that international law really provides no limits or that we have a sort of wild west when it comes to the information space. So that's the orthodox view. And it is justified by this idea or this misconception that uh, we can say whatever we want, uh, the, the, the old free speech absolutism that has sort of like come back in, in recent years. Um, and it's also justified by historical reasons because states uh, and non-state actors have been using information in a multitude of ways to deceive, to advance their political aims. And so the impression uh, that exists sometimes is that, well, international law can't really limit or doesn't really limit this this space or these kinds of operations. And actually what the paper tries to do is really to confront, to debunk this idea, this myth that international law doesn't apply and doesn't limit information operations uh, in any kind. And quite the contrary, what I find and what I conclude in the paper is that there is a multitude, there are, there are several different rules of international law. It's not a very uh, consistent um, framework of rules that are out there. It's more of a patchwork of rules that are a little bit messy, but they're there and they apply together and they limit the, the phenomenon. Um, and so this is the first reason why I, I decided to write this paper. Now, the second rationale behind uh, um, doing research in, in this area is to address the, the lack of clarity surrounding uh, which rules apply and how they apply. So, okay, once we conclude that international law applies uh, to information operations, then the problem is, how does it apply? Which rules apply? And as I said, it's not easy to make sense of the mess of rules and regimes that are out there that, that regulate the phenomenon. Um, and so what I really try and do with my paper is to put together the different rules that are out there and to work out how they apply in practice to concrete uh, types of information operations, as Kubo said, uh, misinformation, disinformation, uh, malinformation, uh, propaganda, and online hate speech. So that's what I did in, in the paper. Um, so that's, that's the second uh, rationale. And uh, what I try to do in the paper is, there are different ways in which one can address how international law applies. So some people look uh, at the rules in the abstract and they work out how they apply uh, to different kinds of scenarios. So that's one way to do it. I've done that in the past. And the other way to do that is to follow the opposite approach, to do a sort of like a bottom up approach of looking at um, the different kinds of information operations in practice and then how the rules sort of like interact, how they work together to constrain or to apply to each type of information operation. And this is the approach that I took in my paper, to really look at different key types of information operations and see the extent to which international law limits each and every one of them. Um, now, uh, the second point that um, I want to make today is a very important preliminary point that it really uh, might affect the understanding of the extent to which international law applies in cyberspace, including in the information space, right? And this point, and I've seen a lot of speakers talk today about the cyber domain and how it's so unique and so different, it's virtual and it's separate. Um, and this is this is one way to frame the the phenomenon, to frame um, to frame the, the 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 new environment, the digital environment. But um, I actually think that the better view is that cyberspace uh, is a set of information and communications technologies rather than a separate domain of activity. Um, and this is because it has different components. It has software, it has hardware, and it has data. Uh, it also has a human component because let's not forget that human beings create these technologies. They use these technologies and they're affected by these technologies. So it's um, a complicated set of technologies that together form this, this space, this so-called so space, but it's not really a separate space uh, of activity that is excluded for legal purposes. Uh, it actually cuts across existing domains, as you can see here in the graph. It cuts across space because we have satellites 
that uh, are necessary for our communications to, to operate. Uh, we have undersea cables that connect uh, different networks uh, on the internet. Uh, we have computers um, on land. So it really is uh, an interlocked, uh, multi-facetated multi uh, set of technologies. Um, and from a legal perspective, this is important because it means that we can't exclude cyberspace or the information space, however you want to frame it, from the scope of international law. So international law applies to all technologies, uh, including information and communications technologies, technologies of the past, technologies of the future, AI. And so we can't really talk about cyberspace as, as a separate domain of activity. And um, what is also interesting is that, uh, something that I touch on in the paper, uh, is that international is flexible enough, it's general enough to accommodate these new technologies, uh, the, new, the new phenomena that, that we see in today's world or in tomorrow's world, right? And so this also means that there's no need for a new cyber-specific rules. And so some people have called for new treaties for cyberspace or new treaties to regulate information operations. This might be a good idea, uh, but at the end of the day, these are not strictly necessary because we already have a bunch of rules that apply together and regulate the phenomena. Now, let me go into the substance and, and the, core, um, the core of my paper, having made those uh, two uh, preliminary points. Um, and, uh, and that is how exactly international law applies and limits information operations. So the, defin the way I define information operations in the paper is this. It's um, any coordinated or individual deployment of digital resources for cognitive purposes to change or reinforce attitudes or behaviors of the targeted audience. And it could be a military or a civilian audience. And I borrowed this definition from the Oxford statement on, on the topic on information operations, which is uh, a statement in which I was involved. And, uh, and this was the way in which we thought uh, was the, the, the best way to describe the phenomenon, taking into account not just uh, group activity, uh, or, um, basically coordinated information campaigns, but also individual posts that cause similar uh, kinds of harm. So this is how we define um, information operations. This is how I defined as well in my paper. And um, as I mentioned before, there are two ways to approach the issue of information operation in international law. Uh, one can talk about the rules in the abstract. So for example, the rule of sovereignty or the principle of sovereignty, non-intervention, rules of due diligence, uh, and so on and so forth, and then work out how they apply to different types of information operations. But there's also a different way of doing it, which is to look at different information operations and see how these rules interact and provide us with some answers about, um, about the limits uh, on information operations. Um, and so the way I, uh, I approach the issue in my paper, as I've mentioned before, is to break down information operations into four legally relevant categories. Um, and um, the reason I did that is because international law applies differently to each of those types of information operations. There are different rules out there. I'm not saying that the rules are different necessarily, but the, 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 uh, the framework or the patchwork of rules that we have will play out differently or they will um, apply alongside in a different way depending on which type of uh, information operation we are talking about. So this is why I, I prefer to approach uh, the issue from a bottom-up um, approach. Um, but I, uh, I did bear in mind, and we must bear in mind, that these information operations, they overlap. And in the real world, what happens is that, different, uh, that most examples, most real examples of information operation actually have elements of different kinds of, of information operations. So for example, in the context of Ukraine, you might be familiar with the famous OPAD that was published by this Russian outlet, Ria Novosti, in which we found messages advocating for the denazification of Ukraine, and also messages, direct messages uh, of incitement to violence uh, against Ukrainians, and also propaganda. So it was a little bit of a and misinformation and disinformation about who was responsible uh, for uh, for um, initiating the, the conflict and so on and so forth. So we, we, we usually see a combination of, of, of different types of information operations in, in real uh, examples. Um, so there is this overlap. Um, now, um, 
even though international law applies differently to each type of information operation, what I found um, in my research when I was drafting this paper is that there are a couple of uh, common challenges that face um, the application of international law to all of these types of operations, as well as other types of information operations. And the first big challenge that I faced is this challenge of the causal link or causality between uh, the information operation, the, the speech act, because information operations are speech acts, right? They are verbal acts. They are not physical uh, conduct, right? And so the challenge is how to connect speech to real world harms, because speech cannot cause uh, an attack against a civilian, for example. Someone needs to act upon the speech for there to be harm. So how do we connect the dots, right? It's, it's easy to, 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 to make the causal connection when someone uh, pulls the trigger and kills someone, but what about a disinformation campaign? And what about more diffuse harms to society or to trust in institutions? How, how, do, we, how do we connect um, speech acts to these harms? And that's a tricky question as a factual matter because we don't have enough empirical evidence of the link between speech acts and, and the, the, the alleged results of these acts. Um, and also from a legal perspective, the law is not very developed on, on, the, on the causal links. And in fact, what I found in my paper is that international law does not provide us with a uniform or a general standard of causation that applies across the board um, in, in, in the field. So we have to work out what causal link applies under each and every rule of international law, which complicates things a little bit further. Now, the second challenge that I found um, when um, doing research um, on this topic is this one, and that's freedom of expression, the clash between freedom of expression and freedom of information. Let's not forget the right to freedom of expression encompasses the right to uh, impart as well as to seek and to receive information. So, so it, it's a right that has this dual dimension of freedom to express oneself, but also freedom to receive information, right? And this right really, because we're talking about speech acts, information operations are at the end of the day, speech acts, right? And they can be um, issued by individuals alone or by groups. And so we cannot escape freedom of expression when individuals or private entities are the authors of these operations. And so the big conundrum here is how to balance between the plethora of rules of international law that we have that apply that sometimes require states to prevent sometimes of, some types of information operations. So for example, the, uh, the prohibition, uh, the, the, the rule requiring states to exercise due diligence requires states to prevent harm to other states, including harm caused by information operations. But if an individual is the author of that information operation, then that individual also has the right to freedom of expression. So how do we, how do we balance between these two conflicting considerations? So these are, were the two challenges uh, that I faced in the paper. Now, how do we address, how do we address um, this challenge? Um, I'm sorry to say that there's no, there's no silver bullet, there's no easy answer. Uh, international law is complicated, and, uh, and, and the short answer is we have to work out which rules apply uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So this is just a, a menu of rules that we have out there. Um, and the challenge, as I said, for us is to work out which rules apply and how they apply and how they, um, they, they interact um, and in the context of each and every information operation, right? So I've left sovereignty uh, with a question mark there because there is a, a bit of a debate in, in the field as to whether or not sovereignty is a rule or a principle, whether it applies or not, which is why I left it out of my paper. But basically the rules that I sort of like consider in the paper are uh, the principles of non-intervention, due diligence, rules of international humanitarian law, uh, rules on international broadcasting and international human rights law, as well as international criminal law, which I forgot to include in the slide there. But um, so, so here you can see uh, the, the, the task in the hands of the international lawyer to make sense of all these rules in the context of, of each and every operation. Um, 
So it's not easy. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, we always have to balance uh, what these rules require from states. And so, for example, uh, due diligence requires states to prevent, as I said, harm. Uh, to other states, including harm caused by information operations. Non-intervention requires states to refrain from interfering in the affairs of other states, including by indirect means, including by information. And it also uh, uh, prohibits states from supporting the actions of non-state groups that seek to destabilize the internal order of other states, including by information operations. Right. So, so those are uh, some examples of how these rules apply. And under international humanitarian law, for example, states uh, cannot, um, and also other parties to uh, an armed conflict cannot, for example, disseminate videos of prisoners of war that might uh, incite or that might give rise to public curiosity, that might attract public curiosity, for example. So we have all of these prohibitive rules, restrictive rules, and we have to balance these with freedom of expression. And freedom of expression, for example, in the context of the International Covenant and Civil and Political Rights, requires that any limitation on freedom of expression, uh, including in the context of information operations, uh, must be um, adopted by law. So if you're limiting speech, basically, you have to adopt law. Uh, and any laws that limit speech need to be adopted for a legitimate purpose, which is a public interest of, a, of some kind, for example, morality to protect national security or public order or health. And any limitation on speech needs to be necessary and proportionate. So the bottom line is that for each uh, type of limitation on speech, which might be required under certain rules of international law, like due diligence, states need to be doing that in a very careful, calibrated way so as not to infringe upon the rights of individuals and private entities to freedom of expression. So that's how we balance these different rules in practice. And it's not an easy exercise, but it is what it is. And what I conclude is that the way in which this balance can be struck in practice is if states adopt legislation uh, regulating social media and online platforms to some extent, and by calibrate, by laying down in legislation or regulation, which kinds of speech acts or information operations are um, or should, should be limited in each and every circumstance, as well as the different measures that states can adopt to limit those different speech acts. And every limitation needs to be necessary and proportionate. To, uh, to, the, to the severity of the, of the speech act, of the information operation at hand. So this is basically how we do it in practice. Now, I will leave this to the Q&A. Uh, I've mentioned the Oxford Statement on International Protections in Cyberspace, and I drew a lot of my definitions and a lot of my, my concepts from this. Uh, and basically, my paper is an expansion of the Oxford uh, Statement on this issue, but I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A. And I'm going to leave it there, Kubo. Thank you, Talita. So thank you indeed for this very comprehensive overview. You know, you say it's a patchwork of rules, but you have really managed to identify a red thread that I think we will all agree that runs through this area of the law. So thank you for that analysis to get us started, to give us a bit of an overview of uh, the applicable rules of international law when it comes to information operations. And so next up, uh, we have Lindsay Freeman. So Lindsay is the director of the Technology, Law and Policy Program at the Human Rights Center at uh, UC Berkeley School of Law. And she is an international criminal lawyer with experience that spans multiple jurisdictions, including the International Criminal Court. And so today, Lindsay is presenting a paper. So like Talita's paper, it's also part of the conference proceedings. And the topic is the impact of information operations on war crimes investigations in Ukraine. Lindsay, over to you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to be talking about the impact and practical implications of information operations using the Russia-Ukraine conflict as a concrete example. Uh, information operations is already a well-covered topic by people who really specialize in this. So what I'm hoping to do today and what I tried to do with the paper is come at it from a different perspective, that of a war crimes investigator, of somebody who is trying to piece together the evidence and establish the facts of what happened on the battlefield to determine whether war crimes have occurred, and if so, who is responsible. 
Um, and actually, this paper came about through an investigation of the more traditional cyber operations of looking at cyber attacks on critical infrastructure and how those could be looked at as war crimes. Um, and it was through that process we started encountering a lot of what is propaganda and different types of information operations. Um, but it was also through looking at Russian military doctrine and seeing the view that information operations and cyber operations are all sort of on the same spectrum spectrum and looked at together as information warfare, we recognized it was important to be looking at this aspect of the cyber operations, as well as attacks on critical infrastructure and industrial control systems. So I'll start by giving a little bit of background on the challenges of war crimes investigations and how these challenges led to increased adoption of information and communication technologies over the last decade and what some of those initial challenges with using a lot more digital evidence were. And then I'll move to Ukraine and what we're observing there and the new challenges it's that are emerging, and then I'll very briefly touch on some potential solutions, but that's also something we can cover in discussion and questions, um, depending on timing. So war crimes investigations are complex by their very nature. Um, they involve hundreds or thousands of victims, witnesses, potential perpetrators, multiple incidents over large geographic scope, um, over a long temporal period. So you're balancing already a tremendous amount of data and information compared to a regular criminal case. Um, and then on top of that, now that the digital realm is playing such an important role, it multiplies by a significant amount the amount of information that we're dealing with. You also have vulnerable victim populations and challenges in collecting the evidence. You know, it's battlefield evidence if it's in those conditions. Um, maintaining chain of custody might not be possible if you have that. Um, or it might be an insecure location even after hostilities have subsided. And this has been a particular issue with the International Criminal Court over the years where they've had situations like in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there were certain parts of the country where there were crime scenes that were still not secure for investigators. And so they had to rely on intermediaries as a result or situations like Sudan and Burundi and Myanmar, where because of the politics of it, they're not allowed in the country at all. So in order to move the investigation along and do something when you can't actually get on the ground and talk to the witnesses that are there, um, the use of remote investigation techniques seemed really promising. And this is like satellite imagery, drones, social media, um, this movement towards more remote investigation techniques and use of ICTs also came out of the ways in which different uh, it, populations and groups have been using ICTs and digital technologies in armed conflicts. So just quickly, some examples, starting with the Syrian civil war, the widespread use of uh, smartphones and social media from the very start of this conflict meant a uh, ton of content coming up. Um, at one point, somebody had the statistic there were more hours of video on YouTube of the conflict than actual hours in the conflict itself. Um, so a lot of groups were trying to figure out how do you preserve this information? How do you find the signal and the noise of what's relevant? Um, and yeah, there were groups like the White Helmets who would wear GoPro cameras when they'd go in and do their humanitarian acts and then post that on the internet. Um, but it was helpful because a lot of journalists couldn't be on the ground then. So you had this emergence of a new category of citizen war crime documentarians, you know, seeing it from the eyes of the people on the ground. A few years later, you had the downing of MH17, and in this case, several sort of amateur online sleuths jumped in immediately after the attack occurred, and I think almost within hours, within the next day, they had found footage people had taken of a convoy going to the site where the missile was launched, um, showing that Russia was responsible for the attack. 
um, is, which is something they put out a few days later, and years after that was a conclusion that was ultimately confirmed by the Joint Investigation Task Force. Um, in Myanmar, you had Facebook being used in a different way um, to incite and spread hate. Um, and so in, by that sense, um, the information that was being put out by military leaders, political leaders, religious leaders to incite violence against the Rohingya population, which culminated in um, big bouts of violence in 2016 and 2017, um, could be used not to show proof of the crimes, but proof of intent and knowledge of the perpetrators. So it was kind of this other way of using digital evidence. And finally, in 2017, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for a Libyan commander, Alwar Fali, based primarily on seven videos found on social media in which he was either directly executing or ordering the execution of 33 people altogether across the seven videos. So that was sort of game changing in that this information was no longer just being used as lead information, but it actually was showing the crime in and of itself. It was the evidence. So all of those incidents led to many conversations and the recognition of the need for standards to deal with the issues of the volume, the speed, different working in different languages and cultures, um, but also the anonymous sources and verification being a really big part of that, which led to the drafting of the Berkeley Protocol, um, which is the first set of international standards and guidelines that the Berkeley Human Rights Center uh, co-published with the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in December 2020. So it was kind of just as investigators were getting a handle on this new medium, Russia invaded Ukraine and everything changed, sort of putting the amount of content that we were getting in Syria looks minimal compared to what we've seen in Ukraine. I don't have the statistics on it, but probably in one day, um, we're getting the amounts of content that you get that we've had in the past just as a whole on a certain conflict. Um, so a lot of people have already created really good classifications for different types of information operations, and I define it quite broadly. But for the purposes of my paper and what I'm talking about, I divided it into six different sort of tactics, uh, which I've paired together. So first, influence operations and deception operations. And in the influence operations, what we're really seeing there is two different approaches. One, um, and Ukraine has done this quite well, is the winning hearts and minds, sometimes tugging at heartstrings. Um, so using real content, not deceptive content, um, but still framing it in a certain way. And this is something that's really important whether people know it or not, there is a perspective with which they're shooting the photo or shooting the video and posting it online and the information they post with it um, there and um, as well as the more insidious intentional influence operations that you might see, but really seeing a lot of effort to create content that can go viral. So you've seen really high production value in information that is coming from the Twitter accounts of official military and governments um, as well um, as the deception techniques. And one of the examples I use in my paper is that of the ghost of Kiev, which early on in the conflict um, was something, there was this story of this hero fighter pilot who was shooting down an incredible number of Russian jets. Um, and journalists even reported on this. Then it was later acknowledged or admitted by the Air Force that, that it was more of an influence campaign um, meant to inspire people, Ukrainian forces, but that it was made up. Um, but that raises questions as an investigator if you have an official entity, you know, in the conflict, one of the parties telling you the number of jets shot down, you know, the things you want to rely on, and then finding out actually that wasn't accurate. So adjusting to those conditions. Um, 
And these are issues because investigators are human. Even if they're very well trained, we are all susceptible to biases. And there's still not enough training on recognizing the different types of biases that you have here. So anchoring bias is an especially significant one because in, uh, I think, one uh, Twitter-based study showed that lies travel six times faster than facts. So if you take that statistic and also pair that with just the reality that good fact-checking takes longer, so the journalists doing a more thorough job are not going to be the first ones out there, it means it's more likely than not that people are going to see the inaccurate version of events first. And if you have this anchoring bias, that's really tricky. Um, some of these other ones I'll come back to as I'm talking about the other operations. But next, chaos and control. So the flooding the zone approach, um, which is about large quantities of content. So it doesn't matter if it's real or fake. It's just tons of conflicting stories um, where the goal is not getting somebody to believe what's there, but just getting them to undermine trust altogether. Um, or just exhausting people. So um, if you're trying to verify every piece of content, there's just too much to do. And this is really facilitated by technologies like use of botnets and automation, as well as artificial intelligence. So huge quantities of content can be produced really quickly and be can be convincing enough that it's hard for the average consumer to tell the difference. Um, comparing that to the opposite well, not the opposite, but a different technique, which is micro-targeting and information silos that have been created on the internet. Um, so that's the very direct, specific messaging targeted at specific populations, which might be harder to see. So that you have these different tactics that are requiring the need for diversified investigation techniques. Because if you have the flooding the zone approach, you can use automated scraping tools to collect that large volume of data, but you're gonna miss some of the things that are in those information silos or like the micro targeting if you're not really thinking about it and putting that human investigative lens on. Um, for example, if you have 18 people on a Discord channel sharing hundreds of classified documents, those documents can sit there for months without anyone noticing them because it's not being picked up by the other methods that have been set up there. So I see sort of one is searching through a vast ocean of information, but then also searching every all these different rivers um, and knowing where to look, which again takes a different type of training. Um, and finally, exposure and concealment. So a lot of hack and leak operations. And this I those I think are probably the most significant and challenging issue arising for lawyers is how to deal with the vast amount of leaked information that has become available. Because since the beginning of the conflict, on an almost daily basis, I get alerts for new troves of documents coming from private companies, coming from government, allegedly. Um, and these come with huge security concerns because they could just be lures and laced with malware, and that could be why they're out there. So downloading them could be an issue. Legal issues, because they might have been acquired illegally. And for lawyers, if we want to admit it as evidence in court, it might not be admissible because of the way it was obtained. Um, and then, of course, verification is very difficult, if not impossible, with some of these, some of this leaked information. But journalists are using it. Other people are using it. So this is a big conversation I think lawyers need to have sort of immediately is like how we're going to deal with it. Are we going to use this information that is in the public domain but not intended to be public? Um, and then finally, internet shutdowns. And um, so we see this being used all over, but definitely in occupied territories. Um, the Russian government's come in and sort of taken over the infrastructure and controlling the flow of information through um, the infrastructure. And 
So these can cause some issues of existing assumptions that we once had no longer apply. So one thing when I've talked to different journalists and law enforcement about how they verify um, a large amount of leaked documents, a lot of them say, well, it's too big to, for somebody to have faked it all. You know, it's this really large trove. It's 80,000 documents. Nobody could fake that. Now that you have ChatGPT and these other models that have come out, that's no longer true. You could take all the documents Snowden leaked, the NSA documents, you know, the model can be trained on that and then produce very quickly things that look very convincing, maybe not to somebody in the NSA, but to the average person and put them out there. So we have to question some of these assumptions that used to be relied on. Um, and another one with the shutdowns, one thing we've seen in places all over the world or conflicts in many parts of the world is that um, when an attack is occurring, say on a village or there is a more violent crackdown, that internet is being cut out at those times. So you're having this information blackout. So you don't get the information like you had in Syria of what's happening um, because things have been blocked. And so that can give a skewed perspective of what's happening if you start relying and expecting that any big violent activity is going to be well covered by information and having a lot of uh, images out there, but you're going to have an absence of it for certain points of time, and it's going to mean certain views are represented online while others are missing, and so really paying attention to that um, is important. Um, Yes, and so going to developing tools for how we deal with this. Um, going back to the Berkeley Protocol, so that was a first step dealing with some of these other problems, but it doesn't address things like leaked and hacked documents. Um, and because it is international standards and in a high level framework, it doesn't have protocols or specific guidance, which um, right now from the Russia-Ukraine conflict, a lot of investigators or civil society groups are asking for that guidance that is more hands-on, more like a standard operating procedure. So there's a need to supplement this more high level document with more specific documents um, and it can be built on to address these new issues as people are seeing it. Um, because the Berkeley Protocol is also technology agnostic, we didn't focus on tools because we wanted to future-proof it and the tools and technologies themselves are always changing. So it's much more focused on principles um, and things that could be applied internationally. So also having context specific guidance is going to be really crucial. Um, then using new tools and technological development. So AI and machine learning and all the other technologies that people are talking about are not only being used as part of information operations, but they can be used by war crimes investigators to help with their job in three key areas that are already well in practice and have been for a few years are natural language processing, object recognition, and facial recognition. Uh, the images come from a company called V-Frame, which uh, did object recognition for cluster munitions. Um, but there's a lot of building of new models that are specific to different conflicts. But, um, you know, it's valuable, it's promising, but a lot of these technologies are experimental or come with other issues. Um, and then finally, just rolling up your sleeves and doing the hard work, having enough time. I think the fire hose of information that's coming at people every day creates this anxiety and pressure for people to move very quickly and put out conclusions, but giving more time and space to do the due diligence and investigative work necessary is absolutely essential. Um, so with that, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Lindsay, for rolling up your sleeves and writing this paper and for illuminating us today about not only you know, some of the 
traditional challenges, but also novel challenges that are presented for war crimes investigators and also for identifying strategies and tools that uh, we can take. Well, I mean, one of the lessons I'm taking away from your talk is that we need to revisit some of our assumptions. And I think that's a very important lesson as well. So moving on today, uh, we have our third speaker today is Nika Alekseyeva. And so Nika is a digital forensic researcher at DFR Lab, where she's seconded by the NATO Strategic Communication Center of Excellence, also known as Stratcom COE. And Nika's work has appeared in many prominent media outlets, including Huffington Post, BBC, NBC, AP, Der Spiegel, Political, and others. So we're very happy to have you here today, Nika. And today, Nika's paper is going to focus on information influence campaigns in the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. And I'm going to hand the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll be standing. It helps me to uh, deliver the message better. So. Being neither a legal uh, expert nor academic, my contribution to this panel is more actual case studies of how these information influence operations may look like. And I'll be sharing two cases. Uh, the first one happened, we discovered it in uh, mid-August, uh, and we examined how it played out on Meta's platform, meaning Facebook and uh, Instagram. So we came across this post by a page named Winston VC5, a very weird page name. But of course, what catches everyone's attention is the cartoon of Dr. Eurorake cutting the oxygen flow, meaning the Russian gas, to the patient, which is German economy. Very clear message to stop sanctioning Russia uh, because it can harm German economy. And also text in German saying to actually make Nord Stream 2 operational. Uh, what of course caught us uh, our attention was the logo of the known uh, German daily Frankfurt and Allgemeine Zeitung used as uh, the logo for the page. So uh, there's like first, um, kind of a sign uh, of inauthenticity, stealing identity of a known media outlet. So we went farther and it wasn't just a post, it was actually paid promoted post on Meta. So it can target specific audiences in Germany. And it also uh, amplified a hyperlink uh, based on domain news.build.lcc and build is another known German tabloid. So another impersonation attempt. By uh, searching what other posts using that domain uh, are there on Facebook, we came across uh, six pages in total. Also advocating to lift sanctions uh, and talking about economical harms. All these uh, pages changed their logo or profile images in the same date. Nevertheless, their creation dates were different, but all made in July. So uh, the language, um, as, as, as verified by Ger German native speaker, wasn't good. So underlined, you can see instances where a German speaker would not use such language, which implies that a non-German speaker or perhaps person from outside of the country uh, Fact made these posts. So we shared this discovery with uh, Meta. Uh, and uh, in September, uh, the big takedown was announced. And according to Meta, it was uh, the largest of its kind since the war in Ukraine began. We weren't the only ones uh, working on the case. EU Disinfo Lab also did a great job and it connected many dots that we didn't have time uh, to, to dig into. So we examined over 1,600 Facebook user accounts, and many of those accounts were using stolen images from the web or AI-generated profile images. We dive deeper into uh, over 700 Facebook pages, and what was uh, very evident was very similar naming pattern. So winsome, uh, two letters and uh, number, was kind of the, the biggest 
naming pattern that, that we saw, but also the, the green bubble shows the another naming pattern for open opinion uh, pages that, and these words, open opinion, were translated in different languages, including in Latvian, uh, which was interesting discovery because it was wrong, uh, the gra grammar was used wrongly there. So what these pages posted, they posted, of course, anti-war, anti-sanction, anti-weapon deployment content, or food recipes in Russian. You see, uh, sometimes information operations are not as consistent and coherent as we tend to think about them. And some of the pages actually uh, used identities or created identities of real people. In Germany, the message was about economical harms that society may experience if the sanctions are continued. In Italy, in France, it was mostly against the weapon uh, deployment, uh, really advocating uh, to, especially to the pacifistic sentiments in the society. On Instagram, uh, there also were some accounts uh, that Meta attributed uh, to the operation. And also in many cases, we saw stolen images. And finally, uh, our colleagues at EU Disinfo Lab identified about 60 spoofed uh, domains. And actually, I would say that this is the cornerstone of, of all the campaign. Let's take welt.de, the popular German uh, online media. And here is the spoofed version of it. In the URL, you can see identical article number, which suggests that it's the article that was taken, which source code was copied, hosted on the spoofed web infrastructure, and what was changed was picture and the text. Why I think it's the cornerstone and cheap and clever strategy. Because it doesn't take much resources, you just copy one article. You uh, host it uh, on your domain, share it on social media, person clicks, and if a person misses the moment that he or she landed on spoof domain, if this person keeps clicking around, the wrong Welt, uh, Welt um, um, version, it would land on the real one because all the other hyperlinks are remain the same. So a person may think that, oh, Welt actually is advocating to lift Russian sanctions, as the article suggests. Uh, Germany wasn't the only, of course. As I mentioned, France, imp uh, the impersonated article was 20minutes.com. Also in Italy, ansa.ltd. Uh, and interestingly, all these also uh, promoted posts by paid advertisement landed uh, or were republished on RRN. What is RRN? We also thought the same. So when you click on a link, actually before you land on the actual RRN, you are redirected through rrussianews.com, which of course, it's like a trigger word uh, for us. So we go on uh, the WHOIS record and we see that this domain is hosted on Russian servers. The historic records also show that the phone number is Russian and email used may belong to a Russian national. Of course, we don't know for sure. We can't also say that this person uh, is uh, employed by the Kremlin. We just see that Russian web infrastructure was used. So overall, pro-Kremlin messaging, impersonation of mainstream media, use of stolen images or AI generated, shared features across the network, meaning the naming patterns, as well as use of paid advertisement for micro-targeting and use of Russia-based infrastructure, characterize coordinated information influence campaign with Russian origins targeting, uh, well, European countries. My next case will be more global. And uh, Telegram has become the so-called Wild West, largely unregulated social media platform that everyone uses to spread their information and lies. So uh, we uh, came across uh, 
posts by uh, uh, Telegram channels. Of course, you've seen cartoons like that, uh, implying the puppet and um, puppeteer relationships between NATO allies, or calling uh, Ukrainians Nazis, or mocking, uh, in this case, German politicians, as well as spreading the uh, US biolabs conspiracies. So uh, these uh, Telegram channels actually were, again, using similar naming patterns uh, to target specific countries. Surf node, there were 10 channels, meaning targeting nine uh, language spaces. Node of time, 11. And the biggest one, info def or info defense, there were 35 channels like that. So uh, all these channels were quite open about what they do. They were also openly recruiting people to join their efforts and spread truth as Russia sees it. So what we did, uh, we scraped the forwards uh, and mentions that these Telegram channels uh, used. Um, so we used both Telegram directly and also TGSTAT, the Telegram analysis tool, to extract forwards and mentions to eventually build such network graph, which I will dive deeper into. Overall, here you see how many followers each of uh, the channels we analyzed had, and only top 10 have above 1,000, which, let's admit, is not a very impressive number. So most of the channels had their followership in hundreds. Also, uh, what suggests coordination, besides the naming pattern, was uh, the, the creation dates, uh, especially for Info Defense Network. On October 13, there were 11 channels created, bulk created. So uh, uh, going into each of these networks. So Surf Noise, uh, they, uh, you know, that's the username. So they call themselves Rokot. And this is organization that trains civilians military skills, starting from first aid, ending up with skills that are more useful in kinetic offensive warfare. So in their channel, they posted both their activities, including going to schools and doing various contests, uh, but also um, anti-Ukraine propaganda. So this uh, network connected with Info Defense Russia and Node of Time Russia. And the uh, overlapping channels who both amplified and were amplified by these channels were known propaganda actors as Maria Zaharova, Dmitry Medvedev, Telegram Channel of TASS, RIA, and many others. So we see clear overlap in the ecosystem, information ecosystem there. Another uh, cluster, the green one, was mostly focused around the info defense um, as, as being the central node and many local info defense versions. Uh, they targeted not only European uh, languages, but also, say, Persian and um, uh, Turkish and Japanese and so on. So, it was quite global approach, but Info Defense served as the node of distribution. If you land on Info Defense, they you would notice that they are repost or posting uh, different like adapted versions of the same video in many languages. So we examine language quality. Um, I have many colleagues scattered all around the globe, and using their native language expertise, we assessed that, uh, for instance, Spanish was very poor, as well as Italian. Uh, most of the languages were, they had some grammatical pitfalls, and those videos that were dubbed were also kind of, you, you could feel non-native accent there. Uh, the only decent translation adaption was in Chinese. Uh, Another cluster uh, is interestingly connects German and Italy info space. And again, uh, why the connection is there? Because there is video languages telegram channel, which very similarly operates. So the same video is adapted to different languages and all channels 
uh, in the ecosystem can just pick that video, which is already in the native language, and then they can penetrate and distribute uh, this, this video um, in, in the information environment of the particular language. And finally, interesting, uh, uh, not <laughs> very surprising, but perhaps just eye-opener, uh, in case of uh, Spanish and Japanese um, network, Russian embassies were the most important amplifiers and sources uh, of information that these channels used. So here, I think we are crossing the border between like the voluntary uh, disinformation, anonymous disinformation campaigns that everyone is kind of denying or not, not taking any responsibility for to actually very open game, uh, also on diplomatic level. Uh, just to sum up, so uh, again, co clearly coordinated channels, also openly recruiting volunteers, because we know with troll farms, usually these are somewhat covered uh, job advertisements saying that you will work in digital marketing or doing similar, but actually you're a troll. So here you actually are asked to voluntarily do the troll job. Uh, also poor adoption to local languages, cross amplification with Kremlin channels and also embassy, Russian embassy channels. And finally, quite modest results in terms of subscriber count and also readership, which is the ratio of how many uh, times posts are read in relation to how many subscribers uh, a channel has. So uh, yeah, two case studies to illustrate uh, the new reality. And uh, with that, thank you very much. Um, happy to pass it back to Kubos. Thank you. So thank you very much, Nika, for providing this practical perspective on uh, how one dissects uh, information operations, uh, really including the boxes that need to be ticked, uh, also very illuminating and very interesting. Thank you for that. With the permission of the audience, I'm going to remain seated for the, for the <laughs> Q&A. So uh, we can now move into the Q&A. I can see in the biggest numbers possible that we have 26 uh, minutes for that. So that should give us uh, enough time. Uh, I know that many of you have already been thinking about questions, so this is the time to raise your hand if you want to come in with uh, any questions, comments, remarks that you may have on any of our speakers. The way we're going to do this is uh, we're going to, ideally there are several questions, we'll see, so we will take them in groups of two or three questions and we will see uh, how that goes. So, uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, so I see Deb uh, there in the back. Hi, uh, am I on? Hi. So I'll stand up and uh, so that I can be seen. And uh, this is a question for Lindsay, if it's okay, Kubo, to focus on one person. Um, uh, uh, to start out by saying three absolutely wonderful presentations, really thought-provoking, so thank you very, very much to all three. My question's to Lindsay on the Berkeley Protocol and its potential applications. It's a really fascinating and it seems a really, really critical development and a strong step forward. Um, but I'm really curious as to whether there's been any thinking uh, in terms of the training that you discussed um, beyond investigators and lawyers. Uh, it would seem to me that in terms of priorities, perhaps uh, judges who need to be the uh, final arbiters of whether um, the evidentiary credibility is uh, meeting standards, uh, they may need to be uh, the, the first priority and uh, perhaps not, but I was wondering whether there was any thinking about that and whether you've made any steps to think about training judges. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Deb. And let's just take a few questions. Uh, and uh, can we all follow exactly the role model that Deb has set? So always introduce yourself, please, and tell also tell us also which of the panelists, if there is any particular one you would like to answer your question. I think the next one was gentleman just there in the fourth row, and then we will have one yeah, here. Thank you. I'll, I'll stay standing just to uh, carry on the theme of now it's been set to try and. Uh, continue that good practice. I'm Hugh Smith I'm from the, the UK's uh, Development Doctrine Centre. Um, so uh, my question probably is to uh, Talita mostly, but, but I'm sure there are other opinions. And it's about um, 
I mean, inf information operations and the law in terms of how it applies to one of the components of fighting power is recognised as the moral component and morale and how you can use information, obviously, to improve morale. You mentioned about the Ukraine pilot, uh, other use of information in, let's say, the Battle of Britain to inflate numbers of downed aircraft. So that's obviously disinformation, misinformation. Where does that sit in the law? And then the other one is in terms of a military operation, in order to use surprise, you want to use deception. So what are the limits of use of that misinformation, if you like, for, you know, obviously to get, to get military effect on the ground uh, and the law? Thank you. Thank you. And then we have one in the front, Nick, right? Yes. My name is Nick Wupma, uh, Royal Dutch Army, and uh, next week, CCDCOE legal branch. Um, my question is also uh, legal. Um, when we're talking about military information operations, my mind goes to armed conflict and the use bellow paradigm. In that sense, do you think that paradigm is uh, suited for information operations and managing them? Uh, in particularly, uh, Article 57 of AP1, uh, the, that for every military operation, you need to take uh, constant care considerations for the civilian population. Uh, is that a, a good stepping stone to integrate also the peacetime regime uh, norms that we, we have? So it's posing in general, but I got the question in the first presentation in my mind. So. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And so maybe just to also give uh, Nika a question, because we've had two questions for Lindsay and Talita. So just to give you something to, to think about, and then I'll start with Lindsay and Talita. I, I was wondering when I was listening to your talk, you know, you talked a lot about how to dissect the information operations, the work that you have been doing. And so one kind of bridge that we could maybe draw between Talita's speech and yours was when Talita was talking about the legal aspects of causality. So I was wondering if you and your team are also looking at the empirical side of the, you know, the causal relationship between the information operations that you're looking at and then the effects that they might have in the real world. So what can you tell us from a practical perspective about the causal relationship there? But I'm going to start with, uh, I think the very first question was for Lindsay about, uh, about the Berkeley Protocol. So let's start with Lindsay. Yes, well on trainings, we are doing a lot of trainings. Um, we've partnered with the Institute for International Criminal Investigations in The Hague and have trained a lot of investigators, lawyers and journalists. Um, but you're right, judges are a very, very important audience for this, perhaps the most important one. And they've been on the agenda to train for a really long time. And actually last month I did a first presentation to it. So we're trying to build that out. Um, at Berkeley, we're a very, very small team, so that's sort of the issue with having the capacity to do the training. So we might do more training the trainers or just trying to get the word out for more people to adopt it and pass it on. Um, but yes, d judges are going to be important because they're the gatekeepers in the courtroom and what's the sort of fear, the thing we're concerned about is somebody being convicted in court on evidence that then is later shown to be false, you know, an AI generated photo, um, things that are becoming more convincing and compelling. Um, it's a real concern. So training judges to be skeptics, but also not so skeptical that they don't realize the value in this. It's definitely a balance um, and something we're aiming for. So thank you for that. Thank you, Lindsay. Over to Talita for the two legal questions. Thank you. And I was just looking up the, the specific provisions <laughs> of the, 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 um, the additional protocol to, to Geneva Conventions, just so I get the, the definitions right. So very good question on, on uh, deception in the military context. And that's, that's just part of the game, right? So com combatants deceive others. And these are uh, lawful ruses of war, right? And to some extent, deception is acceptable. So that, that's the, the whole point of camouflage, for example. And the same goes to information operations. So to some extent, deception is allowed. What is not allowed is perfidy, right? And that is prohibited under international humanitarian law. And perfidy happens when you invite the confidence of the opponent and when you leave the opponent in a vulnerable position and then you deceive that opponent. And the same rule applies offline and online, right? And so one really needs to see if the, the, the exact uh, information operation at play 
And that would usually be the case of mis disinformation or misinformation, right? Because that's, that's, decept that's deceptive uh, by nature. One needs to look at whether or not that particular kind of, of uh, misleading information is inviting the, con the, the confidence of the opponent. So for example, waving a, a white flag or making the opponent believe that they are entering a safe zone or that some sort of agreement is going to be reached and then using that to mount an attack against the opponent, that would be prohibited. But oh, as a general rule, ruses of war, so tactics of war that are misleading have always been accepted and have always been part of parcel of, of armed conflict, and so they are permitted. On your point about um, morale, um, and again, it's it, it, the general rule, the starting point really is that speech is protected. And the same applies in peacetime and in wartime. And this is because freedom of expression is not limited to innocuous kinds of, of expression, right? Freedom of expression protects even deceptive. It protects lies. We can we can say things that are um, you know uh, misleading to boost morale, right? So the the, the story of the ghost of, uh, of pilot, uh, yeah, that that's something that you know is is as a general rule permitted. What is not permitted uh, is when a certain kind of speech crosses a certain threshold. Uh, of harm and it causes harm to another state or to an individual and then we are faced with a, a conflict of right of rights or, or, or interests and then we have to work out how, how the law applies to that particular scenario and so that happened for example with um, the videos of the POWs in the context of Ukraine and then social media platforms didn't know how to answer how, how to approach the problem right so those videos were were released uh, to to boost the morale of, of Ukrainian soldiers right to so like to to, to basically um, convey the image that actually we are arresting uh, Russian POWs and that's what we're doing um, but um, on the one hand the problem that we had is that okay prisoners of war cannot be the object of public curiosity, but at the same time, those prisoners of war have the right to express themselves, and also Ukrainians have the right to, in principle, issue those videos, and so how do we work out that conflict in practice? And so it has to be done in a very careful way, and the answer really lies in balancing um, the, the competing considerations with the right to freedom of expression. Uh, and so, for example, my advice in, in that particular situation would be, is the prisoner um, found, is he in coercive circumstances? Is, is that an ex a true expression of, of you know, of, 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 of their will to, to say something on, on camera? So these are tricky questions. And, and the point is that we have to really look at each, each particular piece of content and in context. Um, so to your question on uh, precautions and attack is a very good question. And it really boils down to how we define an attack, right? Is an attack a kinetic operation in the sense that it has to cause physical harm, physical damage? Or does it include something broader such as um, harms to data, right? And that question has vexed international lawyers. It, it, it continuously vex, vexes international lawyers uh, for, for a long time. And, and there is division in the field as to whether or not an attack can be in, uh, among states, for example, as to whether an attack can cover uh, harms that are caused uh, in a virtual or in, in the digital environment, right? And so it really depends. Um, the good thing about that rule that you pointed out, Article uh, 57 of Additional Protocol 1, is that it applies not just to attacks, but to military operations, right? So it's a little bit broader. So precautions need to be taken with respect to military operations. And so if information operations are part of a military operation, if somehow they advance the military objectives of a certain operation, then yes, they are part of the scope of that rule. And states need to take precautions even when they're mounting information operations against the adversary. And so the rule already applies to information operations, but I do think that it would be a good idea to expand that rule to to the peacetime environment or to, to the peacetime context. How? I don't know. 
Thank you, Talita. And Nika? Sure, the causality between information operation and the real implications to human beliefs and mm -hmm. probably even actions. That's a super, super hard um, thing to establish for sure. Uh, I, th I would say that the safest way, and we saw it during COVID, was uh, when we saw many large-scale demonstrations where people basically parroted the same false stories and lies and slogans that they read online and really went uh, with beliefs that masks are suffocating kids, that vaccine is actually um, turning you into a, a zombie or making infertile and all the other uh, true false uh, information that exploited the, the lack of, of course, very specific knowledge of health, immunology, um, and, and all the other um, sciences that, that were very cornerstone to understand what's happening with pandemic. Uh, with war in Ukraine, it's uh, slightly different because what we see, information operations usually poke into existing dividing issues that are, and that exist in society. Of course, uh, so if we go back to the um, inf the first information operation that, that I uh, briefed about, it happened uh, mid-summer uh, when sanctions were about to be like the, the real kind of gas sanctioning, like gas sanctions were kind of, they were announced, but th they were enacted later in time. So of course, everyone, the fear during like uncertainty, what will happen in the future when the gas is really cut uh, was was there. Also, it was end of the summer, approaching winter, like no one knew how like bad utility bills will be. Mm -hmm. So of course, of course, uh, it could work. It could have worked to some extent. But if we examine this particular campaign by the numbers, we saw that it didn't reach... Uh, large numbers of reactions, comments, uh, shares. Uh, and if they did, and, and it was really in hundreds, not in thousands. Like if it's in thousands, we would start to kind of pay attention. It was really in hundreds and only if it was paid advertisement. So this was, uh, a, these two uh, information influence campaigns were largely ineffective what we can judge from by the numbers, but these are not the only ones, of course. So yeah, a very difficult uh, um, relation to establish if uh, information campaign causes it or is like real life circumstances inspire information campaign. Thank you, Nika. So let's open to another round of questions from the audience. I think we have time for at least one such round. So I see Svetalina, then uh, uh, Jan, and then uh, two in the... Okay, so let's take these four. So let's start with Svetalina. Thank you, Kubo. And thank you for these wonderful presentations. I was wondering to what Can extent... You introduce yourself? If yes, you like. Svetalina van Bentham from the University of Oxford. To what extent is there a scope for us to say that in certain contexts, states may actually be required to launch their own information operations to protect individuals from the harms that you describe from other information operations? Thank you. Thank you. Then Jan in the back. Thank you. Uh, Jan Schmucke, ETH Zurich. Uh, I have a question um, to Lindsay. I was just wondering, you were talking about uh, open information and leaked information. I was wondering, when investigating a war crimes, I was wondering what role uh, also intelligence agencies can play in that context, whether, I mean, in court, as you mentioned, the, the information might not be used and they might not communicate it, or in the worst case, even they might communicate wrong information within a system or even to the ICC. So how, 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 how can classified information still play a role coming from computer network exploitation or other... Uh, uh, cl closed sources. Thank you. And then we had two questions in the middle of the room on my left. Uh, ca can you again make yourselves uh, known? Okay. And we will have the mic. And then there was a colleague also in the middle. Uh, Mitra Bilash, Osavul. Um, I have a question to Nika. Uh, do you see signs of usage of chat GPT or large language models to generate comments and content at scale right now, uh, obviously mostly by Russian? Thank you. Thank you. Olivia Reichman, United States Military Academy. 
Kubo, thank you for making the connection between um, Talita's and Lindsay's presentations through the causal link that Talita mentioned between um, speech acts and real world harm, that speech cannot cause real world harm, instead someone has to act. With this in mind, my question is, how many degrees of separation between information operations and their real, world, their real world effects are you tracking? For instance, in the case of denazification claims by Russia and their potential secondary and tertiary effects um, and impact on and the incitement of white supremacist groups in the United States and around the world through the common thread of anti-Semitism. My question is for Talita and Lindsay, but can be answered by any of the speakers, I presume. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, if it's okay with the three of you, shall we go in the same order again? Sure. So we start with Talita. So and there was one question from Svetlina that wasn't directed at anyone in particular. So uh, I'll leave it up to you if you wanted to address it, the question on attribution. So you can already start with that if you like. And then the other one that's directed to you is on causality from Olivia, if so I got if, the name correct. If I understood the question correctly, so to what extent states have an obligation to mount their own information operations, right? I hadn't thought about that before, actually. So that's a very good question. And um, I think that um, to my mind, the first thing that came to my mind when you, when you asked that question is states' duties to protect human rights. And I think that's what you had in mind, right? Yeah. So states have not only obligations to respect human rights, but also obligations to protect human rights, right? And that applies to all human rights. It applies across the board to civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights. Um, and so um, if I may give one example in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, states um, had and continue to have now, um, even after the pandemic, the obligation to protect the rights of individuals to life and to health, right? And as we saw during the pandemic, there was a tsunami of, of uh, disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, online hate speech uh, on vaccines, other treatments, other preventive measures, and so on and so forth, right? And so the, the, the challenge facing states is how do we protect the, the health and the lives and other rights of individuals, privacy as well, freedom of expression in this weird, uh, unforeseen um, information experience space where we, we, we've seen an explosion of, of, of information operations. Um, the usual answer, because again, freedom of expression is a cornerstone uh, when it comes to information operations, it has to be you know, at the center of any legal analysis. The, the, the answer in principle is, well, states need to be, uh, to facilitate a free flow of information, right? So that's the starting point, because sometimes, it's best to let you know, society uh, assess the information for itself and individuals will be able to make a distinction between false and truthful information. So states need to facilitate a free flow of information and that's the idea of the marketplace of ideas and you know, people will find out for themselves, right? But obviously we know that this doesn't work that well in all societies around the world. There are some societies that are more resilient to misinformation, disinformation, and other kinds of information, malicious information operations. And there are other societies where individuals have less education, for example, in developing countries, and the state needs to act and to counter those information campaigns to make sure that individuals' rights to life, uh, to health, as well as their right to receive information, right? Because let's not forget, if there is a, uh, a wave of, of, of false information, uh, then that will affect the ability of individuals to receive truthful information. So to that extent, in those societies, the state does have a duty to counter those kinds of information operations. And there are different ways to do that. States can take down content, they can label content, and they can require social media content uh, platforms to do that. They can enact regulation in that sense. And they can also mount their own information operations to, well, it wouldn't be um, misinformation or disinformation, but it would be um, an information, a propaganda, for example, that favors a certain type of measure over another, right? So that's, it is to this extent that states have an obligation to counter information operations by mounting their own information operations. On the question of causation, that's a very good point. And um, the good, the, 
the 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 good thing about the 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 the, the causation conundrum, as I refer to in my paper, is that um, not all rules of international law, and actually most rules of international law that are relevant to this phenomenon, do not require a causal link. And I was a bit surprised when I was just going through the rules and you know doing my research and actually i found out that for example the principle of non-intervention doesn't really require a foreign state to cause coercive effects in the territory of another state for the rule to be breached actually what the rule requires for a state to be held responsible for foreign interference for example through propaganda or through disinformation is simply an intent to interfere in the affairs of another state or the use of coercive methods like ransomware, for example, is a coercive method, um, or uh, the causation of effects. So actually causing effects is not essential for the prohibition on non-intervention, as well as other rules of international law to apply. So at the end of the day, the causal link doesn't become very important. What we need to look at really deep down is whether it is foreseeable for the state that that particular information operation is going to cause the harms that are attributed to it. I don't know if that answers your question, but this is what um, the paper argues. Thank you. Lindsay? Okay. And in the interest of time, I might just address the intelligence sure. one. Um, in the Berkeley Protocol, we're very clear with definitions and really do distinguish criminal investigation from intelligence work because they are different. They're different purposes, different aims. You know, on the intelligence side, you're trying to inform decision makers, uh, operates on a different timeline. When you're doing criminal investigations, you're very concerned about protecting defense rights, a fair trial, ensuring from the beginning of the investigation that you have all these procedural protections in place. So in terms of how intelligence agencies decide to use leaks and classified information, I, I don't know what their rules are. I mean, I think I've heard some of them, um, but for us, and I'll say, up until now, we have had a policy that we're not looking at leaks. We're making note of what's been leaked and sort of tracking it, but haven't uh, relied on it ourselves. But this sort of what I call gray area content, or, you know, it's in the public domain, but wasn't intended to be public. So it's not really open source, but not really closed source. Um, if it's classified, protected, or privileged, there are different rules that apply if it falls into one of those categories. And I mean, classified information, if it's in the US, there are rules about how you can use it. Same goes for privileged information, if it's you know protected by attorney-client privilege or something like that and other um, protections. But for anything else, there aren't really clear rules. And where it's become a sort of pressing issue that's sort of forcing the need to consider this is, Journalists and other people are looking at the leaks and they're reporting on that. And as a good investigator, we can't go off of secondhand information. So if we're reading the open source and it's another person's take on it, we have to go back to the original document, which has made us realize that we do need a policy for it because there might be situations in which, you know, we have, have to look through it um, and verify it. Um, yeah, so, so that, those are some of the differences there. It is different, though, than intelligence work um, and what rules apply. And also just on admissibility, you know, in the courtroom, you're presenting it to a judge. You're going to have defense on the other side challenging it, and it's going to have to withstand those challenges, which is something intelligence uh, agencies don't have to deal with. Thank you, Lindsay. And Nika? Yeah. Uh, on the question about um, the use of, say, ChatGPT to produce this information, so there are clever ways to do that and dumb ways to do that. <laughs> we haven't spotted many clever ways because they are too clever, <laughs> perhaps, or non-existent. Uh, but the dumb ways uh, is just to automatically connect um, your, um, say, a chat or, or, or your Twitter bots to Ch uh, ChatGPT's AI, 
and allow it to freestyle. Because sometimes if a comment, for instance, involves a link, which kind of implies to open the link and comment on it, ChatGPT would say, I am AI model, I don't have access to that or, or something. And that gives away um, the, this dumb strategy. So that we see uh, quite a bit. Thank you, Nika, and thank you to all three of you to also keeping to the time. I think you've been an excellent panel. Thank you to the audience. Uh, you know, we have exhausted our time, but we haven't exhausted our panelists, clearly, mm -hmm. and we haven't exhausted the topics. So please continue discussing these. You know, we are all here in the conference corridors until the end of the conference. Very happy to continue the discussions. And so it just bears upon me to thank you all for all your time, for all your questions, this discussion, but most of all to our three wonderful panelists for their very rich and interesting and uh, an illuminating presentation. So can we all put our hands together for our panel?